encouragement from Carl Cotton to get going and from others who have supported this. And uh, here we are, hope to have something each week and we're always welcoming new ideas for programs. So our one and only Marty Graham. Good morning and uh, don't mind the occasional cough or throat clearing. I don't have the virus yet, uh, it's chronic, but uh, I'm uh, Marty Graham. I'm uh, one of your neighbors. I've lived here about eight, uh, let's see, six years. I was a diagnostic radiologist. I retired about eight years ago. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Brittany and Jason for getting all this arranged and particularly Brittany for being the <clears throat> director and producer of the program here. Uh, Way to go. I, uh, I was uh, I was trying to decide what to wear, which, which pajamas I ought to wear this morning. <laughs> but uh, I decided to go ahead and wear a shirt, and Brittany told me I probably ought to wear pants too, so I'm... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what we're going to do is I'm just... I, I'm going to go through a little bit of <clears throat> history because I'm a bit of a history buff. And... Uh, then, and then I'll wake you up and uh, we'll talk a little bit about my history as <clears throat> what I what I did in my practice of diagnostic radiology in Tacoma since 1975. Let's have the next slide. Can we get the next slide? There we go. This is uh, just so you have an idea of, of what we're talking about. You can see this is the electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see where the visible light is a very narrow part of this and the middle of it going from uh, red to violet. Below that are things like, like uh, radio waves, microwaves, television. Above that are, are uh, ultraviolet light and what we call ionizing radiation. So these are different wavelengths. The, the gamma rays and X rays are uh, are higher frequency, higher uh, shorter wavelength. A okay, next slide. <clears throat> this is a the Crooks tube. Now, William Crooks was a British fellow. Who you want to come in off... here? Well, okay. But I, I started off as a photographer. I think got into scientific photography or what he called scientific photography. He was actually doing research in photography and, and uh, photosensitive materials. Now, there were evacuated tubes like this before Crooks, but he took the uh, evacuated tube to a new standard, getting more uh, vacuum in the tube, and he put photosensitive materials in the tube, and an anode, which is down below, and a cathode, which is on the left, on your left, as you look at the tube. And when uh, you know, apply a current across this, uh, electrons for us, and uh, he was actually seeing if it would phosphoresce, and they, it did. And uh, he then put a piece of metal across, <coughs> and, and it uh, a piece of metal across to see if that would block it, and it did. I, we have a hand up. Is that Sarah? Yeah. Um, um, am I the only? Are we the only ones that can't see the the slides? I don't know. I can see the slides. I, oh, I I just see you and the other people. Yeah, we see the slide fine. And the way we did it was to um, click on the, the little uh, picture of the slide, and it got big. Little, little picture of the slide. 
Um, okay, clicking. we'll uh, we'll start clicking. Thank you. You have it? Not yet. No, I, I'm still looking. You can push the little dots down there and start the demonstration, and that will bring up the slides. Aha! Task view. Okay, got it. Thank you. I think. Okay. So continuing on with uh, William Crookes, he also um, he also invented the, the radiometer, which most of us have seen. It's the little thing with a flag, four flags on a pin cushion. And notice that he, he put this in his evacuator tube, exposed it to light, and it would rotate. He also uh, invented a carbon filament light bulb. But he lost interest in that. But his uh, assistant at the time then went to uh, America to Thomas Edison's lab to work. So he, this was a kind of the, the beginning of, of uh, a lot of people using the Crookes tube for various experiments. Next slide. <clears throat> Wilhelm Röntgen. <clears throat> Röntgen was a German. He was a mechanical engineer and a physicist <laughs> who worked in several different uh, different university laboratories in Germany. And uh, while he was at the University of Würzburg, he made his uh, experiments on X-rays, his discovery. Uh, it's interesting that in Würzburg, they do have a small museum uh, which has uh, his office and his laboratory, which they've preserved in the same building. I w I've been to Wur Würzburg twice. First time, I spent a couple hours looking for this place and never found it. So we have some friends, German friends, who live in Würzburg, and she is a native of of uh, Wurzburg, and I explained that to her, and she said, I'll find it for you and take you there. So the next time we were in, in Wurzburg, we were in the car. This lady was a native of Wurzburg. It took her an hour to find this place. Thank you very much. But anyway, it was <clears throat> down a long hall with pictures of, uh, of Rengen there, and the museum is simply his laboratory and his office and a display of various kinds of x-ray tubes uh, and uh, Crookes tubes and, and what have you. Well, Rangan was experimenting with a, a, uh, a Crookes tube and he had a piece of metal in the tube and uh, he had a, a uh, phosphorescent piece of mineral on a table, uh, actually a little bit behind him, and he happened to look around and notice that while the tube was on, the uh, the material fluoresced. So, well, that's interesting. He turned off the tube and it went away. Huh, it must be coming from the, the extra, the, the tube. So, he turned it back on, and sure enough, it fluoresced, and then he covered it with a piece of metal, and the part that was covered didn't for us, and he thought, well, that's a, that, that's interesting. So he then tried uh, some photographic paper, and in fact, that that formed uh, it. It became black when he uh, turned on the tube. So he then uh, he was a little bit afraid to to announce this to the scientific community because, you know, he didn't want to be going, ah, that, that Rankin, there he goes again. So uh, so he proceeded to do his first x-ray, which is his wife's hand, which you see there. And it's, it's pretty crude, but it was uh, the first uh, human x-ray. And later on, he, he did another one, which is what he published, actually. And I believe that's the small the little picture down there. Uh, that's his of his lab assistant. And uh, it was a better quality. 
uh, film, but he, he decided he decided to call these uh, X-rays because he didn't want to name it yet before he proved that it actually existed. So he called them X-rays. Later, they're, they were called Rengen rays, but X-ray has become the standard now for that. Okay, next slide. This is Henri Becquerel. He is credited with uh, discovering natural occurrence of uh, radiation. He was working with uranium, which was uh, which was known at the time, and thorium, and uh, but uh, they, they didn't realize that, that there were there was radiation coming from it. He put a a piece of uh, ore, actually, on a a, uh, a photographic plate, and developed it later and discovered that even though it was on a piece of black paper over the plate, that there was an image there, or there was it was black where the where the uh, ore was, and he, he therefore. Uh, discovered that this was a natural radiation coming from that radiate from uranium next slide okay next slide then there's <clears throat> Pierre and Marie Curry this is another interesting story Marie Curry was Polish and, and in Poland at that time Advanced education just wasn't available for women. Uh, Marie's older sister had gone to Paris to study medicine at the Sorbonne. When her sister graduated, Marie went there to study physics. And she was working with uh, uranium ore and, uh, and such. And she got her degree and was going to go back to Poland uh, and become a teacher when she met Pierre. And Pierre was a, a Frenchman there who was at the time working on magnetism, but he decided to join Marie in her investigation of radioactivity, and they actually coined the phrase radioactivity. And they, they noticed that from the uranium ore, there was more uh, radiation then would be expected, and they would, and they uh, therefore extracted uh, polonium, which is another element, and named it after Marie's native Poland. And uh, later on, they noticed, well, with the uranium that they had, that there was again more, still more radioactivity than they expected, and they were able to extract uh, radium. Uh, the radium occurs with uranium and it's, it's actually a one of the byproducts of the uh, decay of uranium. So they, they did discover this in about uh, 1898. And uh, at that time Marie decided uh, she was going to get her doctorate there, and her research decided to make radium her the subject of her dissertation, and uh, she did that and submitted that. And then in uh, 1903, she, along with Becquerel and Pierre, were awarded the Nobel Prize. It's the first time a Nobel Prize had been awarded to a woman, and the first time a Nobel Prize had been awarded on the basis of a doctoral dissertation. So they, uh, they discovered two different radioisotopes at that time. Uh, next slide. Oh, yes, this is... Uh, Richard Wagner, my one of my favorite opera composers. Not a nice guy, but an excellent composer. Uh, next slide. 
I actually put that in just to just to show that uh, all those guys looked the same back then. I don't know why. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. Well, radiology is now best called imaging, diagnostic radiology. Uh, therapeutic radiology is now called the radiation oncology. Just before I uh, got into this, they, they began splitting apart. It used to be that the training was in radiology was two years of diagnostic radiology and one year of radiation therapy. And many of my original partners uh, trained that way. And after that, it split and diagnostic radiology became a three-year residency. And uh, so did uh, therapeutic radiology. So the imaging part is diagnostic radiology, which is what I did. And this consists of the things all listed here. And uh, some of you may, may have had various procedures done, x-rays. Most people had an x-ray done. Uh, angiography, which is study of blood vessels. Fluoroscopy is the real-time imaging and uh, upper GI series and guidance procedures. Nuclear medicine is using ray. Uh, radioisotopes in tracer doses. Uh, ultrasound, a lot of people have had ultrasound. That's not using ionizing radiation, but sound waves. Computer tomography is a, a that's the big machine with the hole in it that you, you go in and the an x-ray tube and a detector rotate around you and the computer reassembles these into images. Magnetic resonance imaging is a different type of, this is also non-ionizing. Uh, non it, uh, what it does very, very basically, the, there's a very powerful magnet that aligns all the uh, atoms in a certain direction and then a pulse of energy kicks them off that direction how far it depends on the energy. And then when they return to their uh, state in, under the magnet, it emits a radio wave. So, and that's recorded and it's uh, in the computer assembles it. That's, that's, it's a very complicated process and I just think of it as magic. So, yeah. Positron emission tomography is a kind of a combination of computed tomography and a nuclear medicine study where the CT scan has superimposed on it a, uh, a scan of a, of a radioactive tracer which is attached to a compound that will then attach itself to certain different uh, areas in the body depending on which substance you use. As you can see the little the little uh, if you can't see the little cartoon it says your x-ray showed a broken rib but we fixed it with Photoshop. We <laughs> <laughs> got a question here, Barney. Yeah my question is for the diagnostician what's the what's the advantage of a PET scan over a CT or MRI. Okay. Uh, the uh, they're completely they're different studies. Uh, the CT scans and MRIs actually show things in a little different way. Uh, the CT scan more or less shows the ana anatomy by X-ray. The uh, MRI is more of a physiologic thing. It shows the uh, the various uh, oh, what do you say? Tissues react differently. So they're they're different studies. Such as bone is very well seen on CT scans, and it is black on MRI 
scans. And a, a, a PET scan is useful for a lot of things. It's frequently used to locate areas of uh, metastasis of, of tumors because you use a CT scan to place it anatomically and then the PET, the nuclear scan attaches to the metastasis so you can place it accurately for therapy. That, that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I was using PET scans to differentiate osteomyelitis versus uh, uh, just neuropathic bone disease. True, that's, that's, that's one of the things. It depends on what compound is used. That's, that's one use. Good, thank you. Well, we're gonna talk a little about, <coughs> a little about the, the technologists. The technologists are very important. These are very highly trained individuals. What, what happens when usually when you go for the study, you'll go in and you'll meet the technologist and uh, they will perform the study. They will uh, quality assure it and send it to the, uh, to the radiologist to be interpreted. The technologists are now, it used to be everybody was an x-ray technologist and then and they kind of went from there into something else. Now there's specific training in each of these and many uh, technologists are trained in multiple different things, and some are trained in just one. Uh, their training is usually two to four years. There's a there are bachelor's degrees uh, and even master's degrees available in these technical uh, training. Uh, they get additional training if they go into a subspecialty of one of these. The certification is by experience and by examination, and they have required continuing education. Okay, next. Next. Can we hit the next? Uh, there we go. Radiologists. I. This is I. Th I think I get, I get a lot of questions about just what is a just what is a radiologist. Well, that's one reason I'm doing this, I guess. Radiologists, uh, the, their training is an undergraduate college degree, four years of medical school, one year of clinical experience, which we used to call the the internship. Uh, and now it's four years of radiology residency for a, for diagnostic radiology. And optionally, which is very common now, one to two years of subspecialty fellowship. And this can be in a number of different things, including neuroradiology, interventional radiology. Interventional radiology may, uh, before long, become its own separate field, just like uh, radiation therapy did a number of years ago. And uh, informatics is another uh, field, which is that has to do with distributing the, the images we get to where they need to go, to referring physicians, to radiologists, to the hospital. Uh, then there are board examinations for the radiologist plus any additional subspecialties, all these subspecialties have their own examinations. And then there's required continuing education, both in your subspecialty and in your uh, general radiology. Okay, next slide. Next slide. It says, when radiologists take a selfie. <laughs> this is a, uh, a website that uh, may be useful. If, if, if you have questions about radiology, it's actually pretty good and it, it's, it's written for the lay person. And uh, some of it's pretty basic, uh, more basic than you need, but I think you can find most questions you have about radiology. 
in there. Well, that's the end of the slide presentation. But what I'm what I'm going to do now is just kind of basically go over uh, what I did. I uh, I started out. Uh, I went to high school in Southern California. Went to UCLA, undergraduate, where I met my wife Karen. And then went to medical school at uh, UC San Francisco. And after that, did a rotating internship at uh, LA County General Hospital, otherwise known as a big county to the locals there. After that, uh, when I was in medical school, most of us signed up for one um, military service or the other because we were all getting drafted at the time. So I signed up for the Navy because I'd been at a, a land-grant college and had two years of naval ROTC before they kicked me out. So I signed up for that. And uh, so after my internship, I was supposed to go in the Navy. Well, there's this one thing the Navy doesn't tell you about, and that's the Marines. So I ended up as a uh, battalion surgeon with the 3rd Marine Division for a year. And the second year at uh, Bremerton Naval Hospital, the old Naval Hospital up there. And uh, that, that was where we kind of fell in love with the Northwest. I, I honestly hadn't been to Washington before. And uh, so I, then I went back to the University of Michigan for my radiology residency. And coming back, we knew we wanted to come back west, but not California. So we ended up in Tacoma, been here ever since. Came to Tacoma in 1975 and joined a group. At that time, there were two radiology groups in Tacoma. And uh, ours was the smaller one. We worked at Allen Moore Hospital and Good Sam Hospital. And at that time, uh, it was Lakewood Hospital and now it's St. Clair, same hospital. Later, we, uh, when things got a little tight, we had to give that up. So we were just at Allen Moore and St. Clair and many private uh, offices. Now, now interestingly, the uh, two groups have grown and about three years ago, they combined. So there's one large radiology group in uh, Tacoma, and they are separate from the hospital. They are not hospital employees. They're a private radiology group that does all the hospitals and uh, the clinics, the freestanding clinics in, in Tacoma. When I first joined the, the group, uh, we were kind of on the basic, uh, basic radiology. We, we were just doing x-rays and uh, nuclear medicine and one a couple of our partners were actually doing radiation therapy at the time but everybody who came after me was a diagnostic radiologist and I think my my greatest uh, pleasure in in doing uh, being with this group was we were the the leaders in town of doing uh, digital radiology and teleradiology. It was uh, it was difficult because you had to convince first our partners who had been doing films their entire career and uh, and then you had to convince the hospitals that to spend the money to do this that this is the thing of the future. It's a little, it is a little difficult to get people to do, to look ahead. And I, I always try, I was on the, kind of on the cutting edge, which made it tough for me. One of my favorite stories is uh, we had a, a neuroradiologist who was one of our, one of my favorite guys and was a very smart, the smartest guys I ever knew. But he was, he was determined that he was going to stick with films. And at that time, when you did a CT scan or an MRI, it was printed up on an x-ray film the size of a chest x-ray. 
in those little boxes all over. And he said, well, you know, I have to put my one finger here and one finger over there so I can look back and forth and see them. That's how I do it. So I finally convinced him, well, you, you know what, Dan, we're changing over, you, so you better get, get used to it. Well, about a month later, Dan came to me and, and said, you know what, you were right. If I had to go back to film, I think I'd kill myself. So we finally were able to c convince them that, that this was a way to, to go. And we went through several different uh, PACS. PACS is Picture Archiving and Communication System. And what, what this does is it takes the images and it stores them electronically and then they are available to whoever needs to see them, the physicians on the, the ward, the people with electronic medical records, the people with uh, the, the radiologists when they read them. The radiologists will come in in the morning and there'll be a list of, of cases that have been done. Uh, and, and we then go through the list and we we get them from the work imaging archive, read them and then the mark is read. Yeah, I have a hand up. Yeah, could you give us a ballpark figure of the cost of an MRI or a PET scan or one of those digital systems? These are uh, remarkably expensive pieces of equipment and it takes a considerable financial commitment from a group of doctors, whether it be a hospital or a private practice, to switch from old films to hard films to digital versus, you know, you can't really have your own MRI in your office, right? Yes. Well, the, it, it varies. I think the first, actually, we, our group had the, the first MRI in Tacoma. It was on a van. And there are still MRIs on van, but uh, we we leased that at uh, and had it at Good Samaritan Hospital. And later we built a building and had uh, a MRI, which is where there's another building now. Now that they built the new hospital there, but uh, they they run probably about three million. Or I'm, I'm guessing I've been out of it for a while. But uh, we then built an office building, which is still there, which has uh, two MRI units in it, uh, plus a uh, CT scanner, so and a bunch of ultrasound machines. So that it, it was quite an investment, but it, it, it was well worth it. But we had to do it, and uh, finally, when the hospital built their their new hospital, they put the MRI in it. They put the best thing was they put a CT scan in the ER so patients could go right into that. They didn't have to transport them three miles to the CT scanner, that which was a good move. So I think now all we well we used we used to sit in a semi-dark room because we had we had uh, view boxes and you'd put the you know, you put the films up, you became quite good at throwing the films on and make it stick, you know. That was sort of the hallmark of the radiologist. But uh, now uh, we sit in a dark room with a mouse and uh, a bunch of monitors, and uh, it uh, and you sit there all day and you get, you know, carpal tunnel from mousing as a matter of fact, uh, that's one of the big discussions now in informatics is using game controllers. You use a game controller instead of a mouse or some other thing, uh, because m many of these things you want to scroll through, which is an advantage. And instead of doing like Dan used to do here and here, you scroll through the image. Yes, Kathy. So question. and. It's based on really today's technology, which you know may you may not be able to answer that well, but 
What's the percentage of error when you're reading an MRI? I mean, as a patient, can we be guaranteed that there's 100% accuracy from the radiologist? Does it depend on the disease? What are the challenges? It's still an art, but it's, it's, it's very accurate, but there, there can be differences in interpretation. I mean, you can get 10, well, if you get 10 doctors, you're going to get 10 answers. You probably know that already, but, but uh, even, even two, two different well-trained, well radiologists looking at the same image may have a different opinion. So it's not completely cut and dried, but the error rate is probably below 1%. Now, these, these folks are very well trained. As since, it, computers, it, since, computers can, since computers can read shades of gray, there's, aren't there Hansfeld units for the <laughs> darkness of an image on uh, x-rays and MRIs that can tell you the density of the mass or the fluidity of the mass? Oh yes, and we do that. We do that routinely. We measure the uh, the, the the density that we see. Now there, there's a the current big discussion in radiology is artificial intelligence. Are the computers going to be able to take over your job? Fortunately, I'm out now. <laughs> but uh, I don't I don't think that's that's going to happen. They can be very helpful. As a matter of fact, we do that in, uh, in in mammography now. There's a there are things that turn tell you uh, after you've after you've looked at the case, you can turn on this thing and and the machine will put areas that the uh, that it questions and you and you go through it and you say no 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 maybe or no nothing. So that's uh. That's one thing. I, I so I sort of became. Later on, just before I retired, I went to being a subspecialist because I did mammography and I did plane films. The guys just coming out were, I mean, they were wizards with CT and MRI and all those things, but they bring plane films to me. Say, what is this? But they just didn't have the years of experience. Back when that was all we had, looking at plain film. So, yeah. Do we have any other questions? Comments? Huh? Are there any recommendations? Are there any recommendations for young folks? Uh, which branch would be the most uh, most exciting to enter today? Which which branch of of radiology? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think diagnostic radiology, and then and from there you have to follow your your interests. Uh, sure. There, you know, there are all the fields are interested. A lot of people are now interested in those who are kind of surgically oriented, going to interventional radiology, which I think is uh, is an up and coming field. It's always been, but it's up and coming. Sure. Yeah. Thank was you, there Mark. another question? Yeah, I do. Sure. Okay, so given the future of machine learning and AI, if you could predict the future, where do you see this in 15 to 20 years? What do you think it'll look like? I, okay, you know, I'll be honest, I have no idea. But what I would think <laughs> is that radiologists will still be doing what we're doing now in a more advanced way and will be assisted by uh, artificial intelligence. Okay. Got anything else? If not, I'll uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, Marty. It's been a joy to have you on board and uh, nice to have somebody with all that intellectual experience in our neighborhood. Appreciate that. Uh, well, next Martin, week, if we next week if we can pull it off, we may have some uh, some updates on the wildfire recovery in California. Uh, trying, still working on that, trying to pull it off. We're looking for new ideas, and we always appreciate suggestions from our group. 
Thank you so Thank much. You for Thank you. Right. Thanks, guys. Have a great Bye, day. Bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Right on. Hey, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany.